Today's message is our royal priesthood, Jacob, intercession and transformation. And the subtitle would be, Don't Let Me Go Unless I Bless You. But first, I'll share a poem in my reflection. I woke up one morning and started to pray, and I began to meditate upon Jacob. I have a section on him in my book, The Awesome Power of God, but I never really taught a message on Jacob. Just then, I heard the Holy Ghost say, Don't let me go unless I bless you. I knew that meant he was going to give me a word of direction concerning how to present this message. I quickly jumped up and began to write this word. He wanted to remind me of the power of Jacob and how he foreshadows a king priest intercessor, praying according to pattern. I saw Jacob in a new depth that I had never seen before. In other words, I had to be made ready to teach this message. And that came from new revelation that I have just received in the past few years. Holy Ghost has said several years ago that we were operating in a prophetic anointing and were ahead of our time. So much of what we wrote we had yet to understand. And praise God, I am so willing to learn more and more about Him and the depth of His manifold wisdom. I believe I'm desperate, but I understand that I am still moving towards total desperation. As Holy Ghost said to me, and now to each of us listening, don't let me go unless I bless you. Are you desperate for me? I will surely see it if that's true. If you will not let go of me unless I determine to bless you. I love you so much, and in my image I have made you an eternal being. Yes, there is eternity in your heart that you cannot help seeing. From before the foundations of the world, you had your start, and I have chosen you to know and truly understand my heart. You were foreordained for many good works, as strange as that may seem. I purpose to bring you into my plan, and in my heart you've been redeemed. How desperate are you to know me and to understand the plan? and have the revelation of my essence, for I am the great I am. I ask you, do you want to be transformed as you behold my glory and seek my face? Is your heart burning for your true inheritance in this eternal race? I have made you to be seated with me in heavenly places for eternity. But just how much time do you actually spend dwelling with me? I am your great king and high priest, and I ever live to make intercession. Will you be like me, agree with my words, and always make that your confession? And in your intercession, you are to wrestle with me, holding on with all your might. And I will get the picture in your heart, and I will certainly make it right. Again, I ask, are you desperate for me? I will surely see it if that's true. If you will not let go of me, unless I determine to bless you. Praise God. Praise God forever. We're going to talk about Jacob, but first we're going to look at our foundation scriptures and see who we have been made. First Peter 2 9. But you are a chosen generation a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And we always like to point out that phrase, proclaim the praises or show forth his praises, means to declare his excellence. Revelation 5, 9, and 10. For you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation and have made us kings and priests to our God and we shall reign on the earth. 1 Peter 2.5 You also, 
like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. As a royal priesthood, kings and priests, we offer spiritual sacrifices or sacrifices of praise through Jesus Christ, who is the Lamb of God. And we declare his excellence and our covenant promises by his word. The word says by the blood of Jesus, we have been made kings and priests. We have to get this in our spirit that our king priest ministry has been purchased with the highest price in the universe, the blood of Jesus. And the question always should be, why would God pay that kind of price to make us something this special? And it is vital that we know what this means. We will begin to see our ministry as king priests more clearly as we review and see the shadow pictures in the life of Jacob. Now you may ask the question, what does Jacob in his life have to do with our royal priesthood or king priest ministry? Well, we are about to find out. You see, Jacob is a prophetic archetype of a mighty king priest intercessor. This type of intercessor produces the kind of repentance that God needs to forgive our sins and heal our land. The covenant confirmed in Jacob is our covenant of intercession and transformation for God's end time purposes in the earth. The account of Jacob's life can be found in Genesis 25 through 32, but for the sake of time, I will summarize much of this story, but I trust that you will read it later. But some scriptures we will examine in more detail. First of all, Jacob is the son of Isaac and grandson of Abraham. He had a twin brother named Esau, who was the firstborn son, the birthright owner. Yet even before the twins were born, the Lord said that Esau would serve Jacob. We're going to look at the difference between the birthright and the blessing. Now the birthright gave the firstborn head of household status, double portion, and the right to inherit the father's estate. Anyone could receive a blessing, but the greater blessing did belong to the one who held the birthright. In the time of the patriarchs, these blessings acted as a last will and testament and were very much desired as a means of revealing God's will. We see the account of Esau selling Jacob his birthright. Esau sold his birthright, selling it for a meal because he was hungry. He needed to satisfy his flesh right then. He just couldn't wait. Verse 34 in Genesis 25 states, Thus Esau despised his birthright. Next we read how Jacob tricked his father into giving him the birthright blessing. And we see that because Esau despised his birthright, he also lost his blessing. In Genesis 27, 36, Esau said, He took my birthright, and now he's taken my blessing. This showed us that Esau viewed them as separate, but he seemed more upset about losing the powerful firstborn spoken spiritual blessing rather than the physical blessing of wealth. Somehow he knew which was the most important but he wrongly assumed that they were not connected. He didn't understand that you just can't sell what God has given you for what is temporary and will not last in eternity. Praise God, we have been given the spoken firstborn blessings over our lives through our Lord Jesus. 
and Holy Ghost is saying unto us to respect what is holy and eternal and do not sell it or trade it for what is temporary. So many have made the wrong choice. Now let's go to Genesis 28. This is the account of where we see Jacob being sent away because Esau threatened to kill Jacob and his parents sent him to Rebekah's brother Laban who lived in Haran. Let's drop down to verse 10 in chapter 28. We are going to look at the next scriptures in more detail. On the way to Haran, Jacob had a dream from God which is so profound and awesome. Jacob went out from Beersheba and went toward Haran. He came to a certain place and stayed there all night because the sun had set. He took one of the stones of the place and put it under his head and lay down in that place to sleep. He dreamed and saw a stairway set upon the earth and its top reached to heaven. Behold, the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. Behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham your father, and the God of Isaac. I will give the land you lie on to you and to your offspring. Your offspring will be as the dust of the earth, and you will spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. In you and in your offspring, all the families of the earth will be blessed. Behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you again into this land. For I will not leave you until I have done that which I have spoken of to you. Jacob awakened out of his sleep and he said, Surely the Lord is in this place and I didn't know it. He was afraid and said, How awesome this place is. This is none other than God's house, and this is the gate of heaven. The interpretation of this dream is the key to the transformation, the perfecting of the saints, and the glorification of the church. The first thing to understand from the metaphor of the latter is that it is symbolic of Jesus, who is the way the only way to God. Secondly, the latter connects heaven and earth. Jesus is the only mediator between heaven and earth. Thirdly, the latter with his steps signifies that there are divine steps to enter into God's presence. And it's so powerful that he saw the Lord in the Holy of Holies, who then confirmed the covenant promise given to Abraham. Now, we, under the New Covenant, can understand this dream because Jesus identifies himself as the latter. Now, in the Hebrew, the meaning is more like moving stairs, like an escalator, one set going up and the other set coming down. Jesus is the mediator who connects heaven and earth. And in John chapter 1, verse 51, Jesus tells Nathanael, what he will see in the future. He said to him, Most certainly I tell you all, hereafter you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. And we also can see the process by which angels are activated. Hebrews 1.14 Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for those who will inherit salvation? Psalms 103.20 Bless the Lord, you his angels, who excel in strength, who do his word, heeding the voice of his word. Angels are God's emissaries on the earth, sent to minister for the heirs of salvation. That's us. They only hearken to the voice of the word of God. They ascend the ladder of the house of God with our spoken prayers and descend to bring the answers into the earth realm. Let's look at the statement Jacob made in, in Genesis 28, 17. How dreadful or awesome is this place? And this is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate 
of heaven. This signifies the awesome power of God that is available in the house of God. And Jesus said in Luke 19, 46, that his house will be the house of prayer. It is written, he said to them, my house will be a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of robbers. And Jesus was quoting Isaiah 56, 7, where it states, these I will bring to my holy mountain and give them joy in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and sacrifices will be accepted on my altar, for my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations. And we also know how Jesus identified himself with the tabernacle of Moses and the only way into God's presence. John 14, 6 Jesus said to them, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And of course, the gates in the tabernacle were known as the way, the truth, and the life. Now through all of these scriptures, Jesus showed us the order of his house as a house of prayer. He showed us just how the kingdom of God operates. Speaking the word of God in divine order as shown in the tabernacle pattern, following the order of the house, is parallel to ascending the steps of the ladder into the presence of God. This type of prayer beautifully shows the process by which angels ascend and descend on our behalf. We need to understand that angels heed only the voice of God's word, not our cries or opinions. Praying according to the pattern of the house of God gives us the power to go through the gate and up to the high places. And the high places is where spiritual warfare is accomplished more easily and effectively. In this realm, we are seated with Christ in heavenly places, far above all the power of the enemy. And we see that in Ephesians 1, verses 20 and 21, and Ephesians 2, 6. In Genesis 28, verses 18 through 22, we see the account of the stone at Bethel and Luz and Jacob's vow. We see that Jacob anointed a memorial stone for the house of God and named that place Bethel. And this was in the city of Luz. Bethel means the house of God, and Luz means an almond tree, which means awakening and revelation knowledge. And that stone is symbolic of none other than the chief cornerstone of the house of God, Jesus Christ. Dropping down to verse 20 in chapter 28, we find Jacob's vow. Jacob vowed a vow, saying, If God will be with me, and will keep me in this way that I go, and will give me bread to eat and clothing to put on, so that I come again to my father's house in peace, and the Lord will be my God, then this stone which I have set up for a pillar will be God's house. Of all that you will give me, I will surely give a tenth to you. We find that Jacob is making a vow or covenant promise concerning the house of God. Let's go to Genesis chapter 32 where the next events take place. Let's begin with Genesis 32 verse 1. Jacob went on his way and the angels of God met him. When he saw them, Jacob said, This is God's army. He called the name of that place Mahanaim. It struck me that he saw them. He actually saw God's angel army. But it seems he was still afraid because he did not yet know how to activate them to protect him from Esau. Next, he sends a message to Esau about where he had been and what possessions he has. And he is asking for Esau's favor. 
And then in verses 3 through 5, he hears that Esau is coming with 400 men. Verse 7 states, Then Jacob was greatly afraid and was distressed. Now, to be fair, Jacob had reason to be alarmed. You don't need to bring 400 men to just say, Hello, how are you? And how have you been these past 20 years? Starting with verse 9, we see Jacob's prayer confessing his covenant promises. Jacob said, God of my father Abraham and God of my father Isaac, and the Lord who said to me, Return to your country and to your relatives and I will do you good. I am not worthy of the least of all the loving kindnesses and of all the truth which you have shown to your servant. For with just my staff I crossed over this Jordan and now I have become two companies. Please deliver me from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau, for I fear him, lest he come and strike me and the mothers with the children. You said, I will surely do you good, and make your offspring as the sand of the sea, which can't be counted, because there are so many. Now, have you ever confess the word in your covenant promises and still had doubt. But we have to keep saying, God, you promised. God, you promised. And in Genesis 32, verses 13 through 23, Jacob sends presents in three different herds to Esau. And because his faith is still wavering, he is afraid, and he is at the ford of the Jabbok River, and he sends his family over the river. And that word Jabbok means evacuation, dissipation, and wrestling. Did you hear that? It means wrestling. Now Jacob was alone, and it's just him and God. Now he had the dream in Genesis 28 and then he saw the angel army and made his prayer and his confessions in Genesis 32. So what's the problem now? He was still afraid because he still did not have the assurance of his breakthrough. But when he began to realize how prayer really works, the only option left he had to wrestle for the blessing. Yes, it's time to wrestle. Genesis 32, beginning with verse 24. Jacob was left alone and wrestled with the man there until the breaking of the day. When he saw that he didn't prevail against him, the man touched a hollow of his thigh, and the hollow of Jacob's thigh was strained as he wrestled. The man said, let me go for the day breaks. Jacob said, I won't let you go unless you bless me. Now these verses 25 and 26 in another translation state, When the man saw that he could not overpower Jacob, he struck the socket of Jacob's hip and dislocated it as they wrestled. Then the man said, let me go for his daybreak. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me. Now, this word bless means to kneel, bless God and man, and curse the enemy. So that is Jacob kneeling to God in adoration and gaining the power to destroy the enemy. Now, let's take a, a closer look at this. This is such an incredible and astounding account. First of all, who in the world does this? You see a random man and you jump on him and start wrestling with him. Who does that? Verse 24 says he was left alone and he wrestled with a man. Really? We get no background, no introduction to this epic fight, and no indication of who this really is. I don't know about you, but I wonder about these things. I mean, when was the last time you ever jumped on some random person 
just because you were alone and afraid. I mean, this is really deep. And we were told his hip or thigh was knocked out of joint, and that had to be so painful, and yet he still continued to wrestle. That's true desperation, and that is truly astounding. I mean, who does that? And verse 25 states, when he saw he could not overpower him. What? Really? Now we know that this is God, and we saw that he could not overpower Jacob. I can hardly process this. Even more astounding, think about this. God intentionally limits his power that he could use to get away from you. But if you refuse to let him go, if you cling to him no matter what, he has to bless you. He just has to. Glory to God. Now this is God saying, in effect, let me go because we have been at this all night. Well, you know, I read in my word that as a watchman on the wall, I am to give him no rest. And Jacob was tested to see if he would let go, even when he was injured. The question for us, are we going to let go of God because we have been hurt and life has not turned out the way we wanted it to? Or are we going to hang on for the blessing, for real transformation? How desperate are we? I have had to ask myself this question. And my answer is, I am not like Esau. I am in this for the eternal reward. Glory to God. Now let's take a look at the characteristics of Jacob, the intercessor. We're going to look at word meanings from Genesis 32, 24 through verse 32. Now the word wrestle in verse 24, Jacob was left alone and wrestled with the man there until the breaking of day. The word wrestle in the Hebrew means to float away as a vapor. It also means to seize or hold as with a grapple. And the word grapple was an iron claw for grasping and holding something alongside. To wrestle is a perfect example of prayer and the essence of praying according to pattern. Through the gift of the Holy Spirit, we have rivers of living water in us. As we heat those living waters by praying the word according to pattern, we release vapors of true worship. These vapors ascend into heaven, forming a worship cloud for God to bring the rain into our lives, which is answered prayer. Here we see that we have vapors rising as we have an ironclad Hold upon God. Releasing pleasing vapors of worship unto the Lord can only come from intercessors grappling with God, praying the word of God in our known and unknown language. When we pray according to pattern, we have an ironclad hold upon the Lord because he is the fulfillment of every step in the tabernacle. Jacob wrestling with God is a prophetic snapshot of the perfect way to pray. The word prevail in verse 28. He said, your name will no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have fought with God and with men and have prevailed. The word prevail means to attain, overcome, have power, and to stop. An interesting note, God changed Jacob's name to Israel, which means let God prevail. So Jacob had to let God prevail or let God have his way before Jacob himself could really prevail. In other words, we prevail by letting God prevail in our lives. The word halted in verse 31. As he passed over Penuel, the sun rose upon him and he halted upon his thigh. Halted means to limp as if one-sided. And we look at the words sinew and shrank in verse 32. 
Therefore, the children of Israel eat not of the sinew with shrank, which is upon the hollow of the thigh unto this day, because he touched the hollow of Jacob's thigh in the sinew that shrank. The word sinew is a leather strip for binding and lashing, and it also means to attack, invade, overcome, and assemble troops. And the word shrank means a sense of failure, crippled, deprived, remove, and to forget. Now let's put all of this together. Prophetically, God is saying that Jacob has the power to bind, lash, and overcome the enemy. This type of prayer gives us the power to attain converts for the kingdom of God. It also helps us to overcome the works of the devil and have power to stop the enemy from destroying the people of God. And Jacob was one-sided. He was focused and one-sided on obtaining the blessing for his seed. And in Jacob is the power to assemble the army of God and remove their sense of failure and inability. The manifold wisdom of God is awesome. Within Jacob is the true power of spiritual warfare. Now, in Genesis 32, verses 27 and 28, God asks for Jacob's name and then changes it. He said to him, what is your name? He said, Jacob. He said, your name will no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have fought with God and with men and have prevailed. Jacob's name means deceiver, trickster, usurper, heel grabber, or crooked. Can you imagine naming your child that and calling him that all of his life? Every time he was called, they were calling for the deceiver. And they wonder why he fulfilled those words. Well, let me tell you, God will ask you for your name and he will change it. Is your name unhappy? Lonely, defeated, bitter, disappointed, failure, or unsuccessful? Think about it. What is your name? What have you allowed the devil and other people to name you? Our new name is royal priesthood, kings and priests, and those who are relentless in our pursuit of him. In verses 29 and 30, next we have Jacob asking for God's name. Jacob asked him, please tell me your name. And he said, why is it that you ask what my name is? So he blessed him there. Jacob called the name Peniel, for he said, I have seen God face to face and my life is preserved. We see... In verses 27 and 28, the man asked Jacob for his name. He then blessed Jacob by changing his name to Israel. But in verse 29, Jacob asked for the man's name. Jacob asked him, please tell me your name. And he said, why is it that you ask what my name is? So he blessed him there. This particular word bless means that God blessed Jacob by being straight, on the level, and honest meaning that he revealed who he really was. Jacob wanted to know God's name because he wanted to enter into a two-way blessing, denoting a covenant relationship. We bless God when we know who he is and can rehearse and recite his covenant words. When you ask for God's name, you are asking who he is going to be to you. In the covenant ceremony with Abraham, in Genesis 15, 1, God said, I am your shield and exceeding great reward. And that means the one who hires himself out to bring the covenant to pass. And later in Genesis 17, 1 and 2, he is El Shaddai, God's might over and against man's failings, the breasty one. The one who does for us what we cannot do for ourselves. In Genesis 22, Abraham also knew him as Jehovah Jireh, 
when he saw God provide a ram instead of Isaac, he looked ahead, saw the need, and provided for it. You see, Jacob wanted that Abrahamic covenant reaffirmed. His grandfather Abraham was still alive until he was 15 years old, and I'm certain he knew him personally. He learned covenant from the person who was used in the greatest covenant ever made. And remember, covenant essentially means whatever I have is yours, and whatever you have is mine. Years ago when I was learning how to hallow God's name using the Hebrew redemptive names of Yahweh or Jehovah, he gave me this word. He said, Cindy, I will always be whatever you need me to be. And another time while reading Matthew 16, where Peter declared, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. The Lord asked me, Cindy, who do you say that I am? Because who you say I am is what I will be to you. We must say who he is to us. And my team knows this because I say it all the time. Somebody has to say it. Verse 30. Seeing God face to face. Jacob called the name of the place Peniel. For he said, I have seen God face to face and my life is preserved. There should be no doubt that Jacob encountered the Lord himself. You can believe it was just an angel. But we believe it was the Lord himself, and the Hebrew text confirms this. It's easy to see why God loved Jacob. Not only did he wrestle all night long through the darkest hours, but he would not stop even when his hip had been knocked out of place. God was wrestling with him and had to ask Jacob to let him go. Jacob has such a great desire for the blessings of God that he became relentless in his pursuit. He proved to God just how much he wanted the covenant blessings by refusing to let go until he had been blessed. No wonder God states that Jacob is his inheritance in the apple of his eye. When we come to the full understanding of the truth of Jacob, we will become that mighty army that God has sent his son to achieve. Spiritually, Jacob became one-sided upon binding and overcoming the enemy and gathering the army of God. He was also one-sided upon reaching the lost, the failed, the crippled, the forgotten, and the deprived. Wrestling with God, which is a type of praying according to pattern, will give you a heart for lost souls and the army of God. The truth about Jacob is that he was a man who referenced God all of his life. From before birth, he had a strong desire for the things of God. In reality, there wasn't any form of rebellion or disrespect of God recorded in the life of Jacob. If Jacob were out of God's will concerning the birthright blessing, God would have told him. Yet God never addressed Jacob because it was prophesied before his birth that the elder would serve the younger. Primarily, the church has seen Jacob as a trickster and supplanter. Yet Jacob produced the chosen people of God. Likewise, when we become the king priests of the house of God, we will also produce the chosen people of God. What awesome power and responsibility we have been given. Jacob's life is a metaphor showing that prayer according to the divine order of the house of God will bring forth the power and the glory to redeem and transform his people. Praise God. In summary, let's look at this final prophetic picture of the perfect intercessor. Jacob is a prophetic archetype of a mighty king priest intercessor having power with God and man. The covenant confirmed in Jacob is our covenant of intercession and transformation. And this transformation is the Lord's desire for his end time church. And in Jacob, we find the essence of true spiritual warfare. Jacob had a dream of a ladder or staircase to heaven. He sees angels ascending and descending upon it, showing us how the kingdom of God, God's house or house of prayer, operates. Angels ascend with our prayers that agree with God's word and ascend with the answers in the earth realm. And I drew the parallel with how we pray according 
to this order of his house using the steps in the tabernacle and Lord's Prayer model. Looking at the life of Jacob, he was desperate for the blessing and was willing to fight for it. It's just not enough to know you have been intended for blessing. You have to be completely convinced and be willing to wrestle with God for your inheritance and blessing, even when you've been hurt. Jacob wrestled with God, a type of intercession, refusing to let go until and unless he had been blessed. He wanted to know through his covenant who God would be to him. And again, what kind of person does this? Just jump on a random stranger and start wrestling. While studying this, Holy Ghost said to me that I do this to him. And he said he is not just some random person. He is Almighty God with a plan for my life that I need activated. I wake up in the morning and jump on God immediately. And I begin to wrestle. I begin to worship Holy Ghost. He is the one living inside of us, our constant companion. So I worship him. The Father and Jesus are not jealous. They designed it that way. We have to get to know the one living inside of us. As I pray in the Spirit, I am using his words, tongues, to release perfect prayers into the earth. I pray according to pattern, releasing his word in divine order in my own language. And I also make more faith declarations. In effect, I'm saying over and over again, God, you promised. God, you promised. Jacob did not let the past dictate who he would be. He fought for transformation and a new name, Israel. A new name that every time it was mentioned meant he was a prince of God, that he had let God prevail in his life. It also meant that he had a covenant with God and the awesome power of God at his disposal. He knew how to hold on to God for the blessing, to cling to him no matter what. When his hip was knocked out of place, that represented his ability to generate his own blessing. But he held on because he wanted God's plan for his life, not his own, and not what he could produce on his own. In God's plan, Jacob produced the chosen people of God through which the Messiah, our Lord Jesus Christ, would be born. And through him, all families of the earth would be blessed. Glory to God. Glory to God. Amen and amen. Again, hear the word of the Lord. Don't let me go unless I bless you. Are you desperate for me? I will surely see it if that's true. If you will not let go of me unless I determine to bless you. I love you so much and in my image I've made you an eternal being. Yes, there is eternity in your heart that you cannot help seeing. From before the foundations of this world you had your start. And I have chosen you to know and truly understand my heart. You were foreordained for many good works, as strange as that may seem. I purpose to bring you into my plan, and in my heart you've been redeemed. How desperate are you to know me and to understand the plan? And have the revelation of my essence, for I am the great I am. I ask you, do you want to be transformed as you behold my glory and seek my face? Is your heart burning for your true inheritance in this eternal race? I have made you to be seated with me in heavenly places for eternity. But just how much time do you actually spend dwelling with me? I am your great king and high priest. I ever lived to make intercession. Will you be like me, agree with my words, and always make that your confession? In your intercession, you are to wrestle with me, holding on with all your might. And I will get the picture in your heart, and I will certainly make it right. Again, I ask, are you desperate for me? I will surely see it, if that's true. If you will not let go of me, unless I determine to bless you. Praise God, praise God, 
Praise God, glory to God forever.